Hi there, and welcome to another video from Max Revs. Today, I'd like to talk about electric cars, specifically the electrical demands of charging them and how ready the UK is for this transformational change from petrol diesel to electric cars. Someone gave me a pointer to check out a parliamentary hearing which took place on the 27th of Feb 2018. I'm not into politics and certainly wouldn't watch House of Commons meetings on TV. However, this one I was told was worth it. This is the audio I came across. Royal Mail as well as um, vehicle availability, they're a great example because um, they worked out that if they switched all of their small vans, which there is a product available, to electric, assuming that they could get them from the manufacturer, which is another problem, um, they would melt the, uh, the, the substation in Mount Pleasant, um, up in, in London where they're based, um, because there isn't the power oh, available yeah. to charge the vehicles that they would need to run. Whoa, let's just hear that one more time. They would melt the, uh, the, the substation in Mount Pleasant. Melting electrical substations. Now that sounds pretty serious. I did ask the Royal Mail if they were willing to share information on the electric vehicle trials they're doing at Mount Pleasant, but I was told that information is commercially sensitive. Nevertheless, the statement made in the House of Commons was so interesting I felt it deserved further investigation. Based on public information, we know the Royal Mail has ordered 100 Peugeot Partner L2 electric vans. This is for the smaller end of their vehicle fleet. And they're also trialling bigger vans and trucks from Arrival, a UK company based in Banbury, Oxford. This is a public statement from the Arrival website. It clearly states that Arrival are working with the Royal Mail in trialling their electric trucks. I was blown away with the design that had gone into the Arrival electric trucks. The website claims the whole vehicle is modular and that a single person can build one of the trucks in four hours. Also, any single part can be changed in 15 minutes. Where did all this technology come from? Well, a little bit of digging tells us the same company which designed this also helped design this. Arrival based in Banbury, used to be called Charge Automotive. The same brains behind Charge and Robo Race are also behind Arrival, so I'm sure the Royal Mail trial with Arrival is bound to be a great success. Right, now we know the electrical vehicles the Royal Mail is testing with. It's either something from Peugeot, or something from Arrival. Asking around people I know, I managed to find out that the Royal Mail site in Mount Pleasant is a major distribution hub, meaning no small vans operate from that depot. This means we can rule out the Peugeot Partner L2 van from our forecasted calculations. Any statements made in the House of Commons with regards to the forecasted electrical demands of that site would have to have been done based on large vans and trucks from arrival. If we're going to calculate electrical charging demands, we need to first go over one equation from high school. P equals IV, where P equals power in watts, I equals current in amps, and V equals voltage in volts. And while we're on the topic of cars and power, let's just clarify, a sudden boost of power is not going to send your car through space and time. Shame, really. This truck electrical, but I need a nuclear reaction to, to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. 1.21 gigawatts! 1.21 gigawatts! In order to estimate the electrical demands of charging the vehicle fleet at Mount Pleasant, assuming they all went electric, we need to know the battery capacity of the arrival trucks. That's not something that's public information, so I'm going to start with calculating the electrical demands of charging a family car at home in the UK. Then, later on, we'll scale up the calculations to estimate for the Royal Mail fleet based at Mount Pleasant, assuming all the current vehicles went electric. The more I looked into charging electric cars, the more fascinating it became. Here's a headline which appeared in the Financial Times, a well-respected UK newspaper. There certainly had to be some truth behind the headline if the FT had decided to print the article. Looking for source material from National Grid, I struck gold with this document. Buried in there was this great piece of text. Yes, that's right. National Grid have backed up the headline with a perfect explanation. I'll give you a few moments to read this for yourself, and then we'll move on to some calculations.
Let's quickly go over those figures. The average house has a 60 to 80 amp master fuse before blowing the feed into your house. This is the fuse before your standard consumer fuse box. It's not something you can replace without calling out specialist help. An 11 kilowatt battery charger consumes 48 amps, leaving you just 12 to 32 amps to play with. To give you an example, a fast boil kettle will draw 13 amps and an electric oven will draw 20 amps. So if you had a 60 amp master fuse, then it's true, using an 11 kilowatt charger and a fast boil kettle will blow your master fuse. The same charger, a kettle and an oven would come in at 81 amps, which would then blow a house with an 80 amp fuse. Ah! Oh my God! Ah! Now before we get too carried away, it's possible to upgrade many homes in the UK to a 100 amp master fuse without having to dig new cabling into the house. I had some building work done a few years ago and my electrician put in a new consumer fuse box. While he was at it, he also upgraded the master fuse to 100 amps. So if I decide to go electric, I'm already covered. Right, let's get back to our calculations. I showed this graphic earlier on without going into any detail. The Institute of Engineering and Technology publishes a code of practice for all electrical work in the UK. In there is a section which states that for domestic charging, electric cars cannot draw more than 32 amps unless permission has been sought from the local power company. So it doesn't matter what size your master fuse is, the ultimate say-so comes down to your local power company. Now let's imagine I bought an electric car. Everyone's talked about the Tesla Model S enough, so in this instance, let's consider I buy the Jaguar I-Pace. And no, I don't have the money to actually buy one, this is just a thought experiment. It comes with a 90 kilowatt battery pack and we'll consider I've got a 32 amp charging socket at home, the maximum allowed without having to contact my local power company. The most common electric car chargers in the UK generally come in at 3.5 kilowatts, 7 kilowatts, 11 kilowatts and 50 kilowatts. 11 kilowatts being the most you'd usually get away with at home. So let's charge our Jaguar I-Pace. Even though the battery is rated at 90 kilowatt hours, Generally speaking, car batteries never discharge to 0%, usually stopping around 15% full. They also don't usually charge to 100% to preserve the life of the battery pack, stopping at around 85% full. So for the purposes of our calculations, I'm going to consider charging 70% of the battery pack, which is 63 kilowatt hours. Charging an electric battery is also never 100% efficient, i.e. it costs more than one kilowatt of energy to transfer one kilowatt of energy into a battery pack, so I'm going to allow for 5% to be lost in the charging process. This gives us a total power draw of 66.15 kilowatt hours. Right, let's do this. UK mains voltage is 240 volts, and IET specs say I can only draw 32 amps for my car charger without seeking approval of my local power company. Using P equals IV, we can show a 7 kilowatt charger will draw 29 amps of current. An 11 kilowatt charger will draw 45 amps. I'll stick with a 7 kilowatt charger then to be safe. So to draw my 66.15 kilowatt hours using a 7 kilowatt hour charger means it will take me around 9.5 hours to charge the battery. If I had an 11 kilowatt charger, which is the most you can get domestically, then the charging time becomes more manageable 6 hours. Now that we have this understanding of charging electric vehicles, let's get back to the Royal Mail Fleet, the Mount Pleasant site, and melting the local substation. It wasn't exactly clear what they meant by melting the local electrical substation. They would melt the, uh, the, the, the substation in Mount Pleasant. The statement made in the House of Commons is open to interpretation. The way I see it, I don't think they're talking about melting the local national grid 400 kilowatt electrical substation. Rather, I reckon they're talking about the electrical infrastructure on site at the Royal Mail Depot itself. No doubt this is something which could be upgraded over time, so I don't think it's something we have to panic about. Yeah! <laughs> <clears throat> we now have two crucial pieces of data to get hold of. The battery capacity of the vehicles in question and the number of vehicles based at the Mount Pleasant site. We know from this article on Wired that a rival are aiming for a range of 100 miles for their trucks. The Jaguar I-Pace with its 90 kilowatt hour battery has a range of just under 300 miles. 
so allowing for the extra weight the truck will have to carry around and the reduced range of 100 miles, I'm going to estimate a battery capacity for our truck of 100 kilowatt hours. This also keeps the maths easy. As for the number of trucks, I'm going to use a figure from Watt Van magazine. Yes, there really is a magazine for everyone. A figure from 2017 said the Royal Mail fleet had 3,700 trucks. Given the fact the Royal Mail has 38 major distribution centres, Mount Pleasant being one of them, I'm going to evenly divide the trucks across the 38 sites. This gives us an average figure of 97 trucks per site, and let's just call it 100 per site to keep the maths easy. So 100 trucks with 100 kilowatt hours to charge each is 10,000 kilowatt hours. This figure is the total amount of energy we need to store into the battery packs of the Royal Mail fleet based at Mount Pleasant. Now before we go any further, we should clarify the difference between power and energy. This can get a little hairy, and I'm no physics teacher, so I'll keep this as simple as I can. The reason I'm going into this is because car battery capacity is advertised in units of kilowatt hours, whereas an electric motor is rated in watts. Power is an ability to do stuff, and it's measured in watts. For example, you probably have a 60 watt light bulb at home. One watt is the usage of one joule per second, so a 60 watt light bulb uses 60 joules in one second. So that's power. Energy, on the other hand, is best considered as power usage over a longer time frame than one second. If I use 1000 watts for one hour, that is one kilowatt hour. So a battery which could store one kilowatt hour could power a thousand watt motor for one hour. In actual fact, as we've discussed, you can't truly get all the power into and out of a battery, but hopefully you get the point here. Let's get a better feel for what 10,000 kilowatt hours is. A typical UK house uses 3,100 kilowatt hours of energy over the course of a year. So we can already see our daily charging requirements require more energy than three average houses consume in one year. I'll say that one more time. The average house in the UK uses 3,100 kilowatt hours of electricity every year. That's about eight and a half kilowatts of electricity every day. Simply put, the estimated electrical energy required to charge the Royal Mail fleet at Mount Pleasant for one day can also be used to power 1,177 average UK homes for a day. So there you have it. I hope you found this video interesting. It's coming at around 13 minutes in duration and my typical YouTube stats show that people switch off after about 60%, which in this case would be around the eight minute mark. If you're still watching now, hey, thanks. You must really like my content. Hit that subscribe button now to show me you care and I hope to bring you a follow-up video to this one soon. Take care. See ya.